Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. Very excited to have our guest join us today, Megan Kelso. She is about to embark on a new book tour uh, to celebrate the release of Who Will Make the Pancakes? Five Stories. Um, she has been making comics since the early 90s. Uh, one of the first Zerick Award grant winners with Girl Hero. Uh, she has four books published from Fanographics, who is publishing Who Will Make the Pancakes. These include Queen of the Black Black, Artichoke Tales, The Squirrel Mother, and of course, her newest book, Who Will Make the Pancakes? Five Stories. Uh, she's also the editor of Shaherazad. Shaherazad. <laughs> yes. Shaherazad. <laughs> Shaherazad. Stories of Love, Treachery, Mothers, and Monsters. Um, an anthology showcasing the work of 23 major female graphic novelists. And I'm trying to think the best place to begin, Megan. You have done a lot and been making comics for, this is your fourth decade making comics, which is amazing. When yeah. I started getting into comics, I found your work pretty early on. And it would have been like, I even dug out like Girl Hero. Uh, oh, yay. <laughs> my taste moved away from like the Marvel DC stuff. And I was looking for something that was still comics, but I didn't really know indie comics very much. And they were a relatively small group of creators in the 90s and getting into the early 2000s. And that's whenever I found your work. I remember um, finding your website and reading like interview with Brian Ralph. And I was like, this is great. You know, I'm finding my way into this stuff. But it seemed like there was a group of maybe a second wave of alternative cartoonists, like a second generation. And, and that's kind of where I think of you as, as fitting in that like post 80s alternative cartoonists. Um, how did you get into comics? Um, well, I, I started drawing comics in my last year of college and, um, I, I didn't really know, I, you know, I didn't really grow up reading comics much except what was in the newspaper and maybe like Archie comics at a sleepover or something, but, um, I'd always really loved to draw and I'd always written stories and I had started out in art school, um, but I dropped out after a semester. I went to the um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago and, and we were just not a good fit. Um, so then I, you know, took some time off and went to a state school here in Washington State called the Evergreen State College, which is um, it's, it's an alternative college, kind of like Santa Cruz. Um, kind of like Hampshire College, no requirements, no grades, a lot of chances for independent study. And I kind of just left my art behind for a while and studied history and political science. But I never stopped drawing because, you know, I couldn't. And then there was just this kind of explosion going on at Evergreen and Olympia, Washington, the town that Evergreen's in at the time. It was, um, there were just tons of bands forming. K Records was happening. Sub Pop was starting to happen up in Seattle. It was just this, it was just this rich time of um, people making art of all kinds and and really the the DIY ethic of, like just start it, even if you don't have a lot of skills. And people were making zines, which I'd never heard of before, uh, but it was just happening all around me. And because I like to draw, I basically started Girl Hero more um, with the kind of zine aesthetic because I was just kind of copying what I was seeing around me. Um, it wasn't until I graduated from Evergreen and moved back to Seattle, which is my hometown, that I started really meeting other cartoonists. And I, I wasn't really aware of it at the time, but Fanographics had recently relocated to Seattle from Los Angeles, and it had attracted a lot of cartoonists in their wake. Um, like Pete Bagg had, had recently moved to Seattle and um, Jim Woodring, and um, I just kind of indirectly through um, some friends of my sisters um, found Jason Lutz, who was interning at Fanographics at the time, and or maybe he might actually have had a real job at that point. He was working as a um, in the in the design department, and 
he was kind of my way in to, to meeting a whole bunch of other cartoonists in Seattle. And it was all due to my sister who doesn't do comics or knew anything about it. But she was like my roommate's boyfriend, sister's friend, <laughs> this guy who works at a comic publisher. I mean, it was just this really just kind of cool, mysterious way in. And, and Jason, you know, is, is this amazing person and taught me a lot about, um, how to actually draw comics because it was really just kind of floundering around at that point um, and introduced me to a lot of other cartoonists, including John Lewis and Tom Hart and Ed Brubaker had moved to Seattle at that point. It was just, it was this really, uh, James Sturm, um, just, it was this kind of nexus Seattle was at that point. And I, I just kind of lucked into it because Seattle is my hometown. Yeah, it's so interesting how these, um, like I'm in Pittsburgh, I've been here for like 25 years now, and you find the other cartoonists that are local and hopefully uh, sympathetic to, you know, what you're trying to do because, um, you know, it's not necessarily a big scene. Seattle, I feel like, is one of those legendary ones, though, but as I was getting into the making comics and meeting people and going to conventions, it would always be like, oh, where's this person from? What's that group? You know, it always yeah. interested me. Like St. Louis yeah. was big Saint um, Louis. whenever yeah. I was starting out, you know, so like you get these little pockets from wherever you'd meet the Mocha or SPX and start, you know, trading through the mail. Were you doing that? Were you sending, like, once you start making Girl Hero, are you trading with people? Or are you finding people outside of Seattle? Yes. Um, I mean, it was interesting because you're right. I could have just I could have just hung out with Seattle cartoonists forever <laughs> and that would have been enough. I mean, Ellen Forney was here um, or it still is here. Jennifer Daydreamer. Yeah. It was really rich and it was, and, and I, and I was learning so much from these people who actually, you know, had been making comics for a while and knew what they were doing. And, and for example, John Lewis was the first person who told me about fact sheet five. And he was the person who explained to me that what I was making wasn't at that time, we, we made a distinction between mini comics and zines. He said, you're not making a zine, you're making a mini comic. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he said, there's this, there's this incredible magazine called fact sheet five, and you can, you can send your comic to it and then they'll list you and people can order mail order it from you. So you've got to get a PO box. I remember him telling me, get a PO box and uh, you can order comics from other people. And it's this really cool thing. And so, um, yeah, I just totally hopped on that bandwagon. And meanwhile, I had this, this other stroke of good luck, which was that uh, in Olympia, I'd been friends with Kathleen Hanna who started Bikini Kill. And when they were touring, they were just handing out their own version of Fact Sheet 5. It was just this Xerox piece of paper with names and addresses of, of, of people you could send away to get cool zines or records or comics. And they put me on it. And uh, I just got tons and tons of requests uh, for my comic because of the, the Bikini Kill connection. Um, that was pretty rad. It's so interesting. Like, you know, that's probably the last generation before the internet shows up. And then we start sharing information that way and, you know, kind of tracking down creators and comics through the internet. But that 90s, like mail, you know, trading through the mail, finding those fact sheet five type outlets. It's just almost a different world. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really it is. And it, it's to me, it doesn't seem that long ago. And yet it, it, it just utterly transformed with the internet. I was, I was looking through some old mini comics recently, getting ready for a panel I was going to be on. And I, and I had sort of forgotten that what, what we cartoonists started doing was we would have a section in the back of our comic listing, like, our friends' comics and their addresses and how to get a hold of their stuff. Like there would be these mini catalogs in the back of a lot of people's own work. And I had this weird moment where I was like, 
why are why are we wasting all this page space listing <laughs> other people's comics? And then I realized like, oh, there really wasn't any other way to get this information out. It was a really important source because it was like, well, if you like this comic, you might like these five others. And I was just shocked at my own kind of amnesia that like how quickly I'd forgotten how crucial that was. The yeah. directories, directories were so important. It was always, um, you know, like we look at Wizard Magazine on Cartoonist Kayfabe and mm -hmm. the, the one column that we always read, it's like the indie comics column, but there's constantly like further reading or recommendations from, you know, whoever the, the, uh, the like the artist is that month that's, that they're interviewing, you know, it's constantly trying to find what else should we be looking at? Because like, it was hard to, you know, it's, it's, it's a small community to begin with. And then, you know, comics. And then whenever you slice that into smaller pieces of like alternative comics or self-published, it really became, you know, talk about obscure, um, you know, nobody's intent, but I mean, like you had to basically say like, Hey, this is good. Go read, you know, eight ball or whatever, you know, they would do it too. Like I would see an eight ball and yummy fur. I remember both of those, like in the letters columns, um, they would often highlight other books. Um, Julie yeah. Doucette, you know, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a different time, but it really bleeds into that small press. So, you know, not making this about me, but whenever I start like really getting into mini comics mm -hmm. and stuff is 2000 is my first SPX. Okay. And I can remember like coming home with boxes of, of mostly stuff I've traded, you know, because like I was making comics, but nobody was buying those. <laughs> um, but, those, you know, there was a community of like other people that were in the same position of like, mm -hmm. we're just making photocopied mini comics and mm -hmm. yeah, take one or trade one or whatever. And I came away from that show as like never having seen that amount of creative comics. Um, you know, they, it was just such a, almost a different medium than what I was used to because up to that point, I just really didn't have access to mini comics or that very alternative indie self publishing community. And SPX gave me that um, initially. Yeah. And it was like my head exploded with like, Oh, you can make comics any size about anything. Um, you know, and it was really a takeoff point. But then, you know, you would go back to the creators like a John Porcelino or somebody who had this back catalog and who had been doing it for a while. And I was just like tracking down everything I could once I got that access. Like once right. you get that first directory or, or, or mini comic that lists a few other books, you could really dive into it. Um, yeah, I think everybody kind of remembers like what was their way in? Because once you found a way in, it would lead it would lead to other things that you'd think, oh, I, I'm going to try and read that. I'm going to try and read that. I mean, you know, the whole the whole record store, Maximum Rock and Roll world was was connected. You know, Maximum Rock and Roll also reviewed comics. And, um, you know, you could send your comic in there and get reviewed. And then that would that would open you up to another world of people who might be interested who are more like music people but also like comics and yeah it was just it was such a weird it was such an interesting and weird time um i started getting sent i started getting sent free records from record companies because just because it was on some list you know <laughs> it it yeah that's funny the, the first show i went to that was kind of like the the spx experience you had was i went to eight um it was down in san jose at the time and it was um it was started by a guy who owned a comic book store dan vado slave labor yeah he was my he published slave labor, the album. name of the comic store as well as his publishing i don't know if that was the name of his store or not um but you know definitely it was the publisher yeah and i mean like, he seems like, a. I didn't know him very well, but he seems like a pretty visionary guy because there weren't really a lot of small press shows. I mean, there was the San Diego Comic-Con and then there were other little sort of collectory things. But, but these small press shows, it was all pretty new in the 90s. And I think the first time I went to Ape was maybe 94 four or something around that and I don't I don't know honestly I don't know if it was the first one it, it seemed early days um and what I'll what I'll never forget is there was a representative from Kebacore which was like a big comics printing company in Canada <laughs> and he was like wearing a suit and he was kind of you know he looked like a businessman and he he uh he sponsored this like 
after the show free food at a bar thing. And like, <laughs> I'd never gotten free. Like th it was just this whole like sort of business promotional world. Like I'd never experienced that before. And of course he wanted us all to get our comics printed at Kebacor. <laughs> um, yeah. That was just like, wow, I've hit the big time, man. Someone's giving me free uh, hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we need to like raise the bar a little uh, in what we expect as cartoonists. <laughs> I think that's evolved, though. I feel like we uh, we expect a little more than that these days in 2023. <laughs> uh, I hope um, so. <laughs> so let's segue into uh, who will make the pancakes. You mentioned about your love for drawing, and it's something that really comes through in that book. Um, it's a collection of five stories. Uh, we can touch on those a little bit. But I was excited reading it just from the art standpoint is like you work with different materials. When I was reading it, I wondered like, is this coming out of an iPad? Because there's line art, there are black and white pieces, there's full color, flat color, watercolor, color pencils. Um, as somebody who also likes to draw and loves all these different materials, it really spoke to me. And mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about like, I don't know, your use of different materials? That's not something every cartoonist does. Yeah, um, I'd love to talk about that. So this episode is brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. Our patrons have first access to the videos, so they get a leg up on the Kayfabe effect. And if you're a King Kayfaber, you actually can sit in on our weekly recording sessions and uh, talk comics with us live. Cartoonist Kayfabe is also brought to you by the comics that we make. My next book is Street Angel, Princess of Poverty from Image Comics. It'll be out this summer. You can pre-order that now. It collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not included in Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, also available now from Image Comics. My other titles include the first young adult graphic novel, The Plain Janes, and Hulk Grand Design. Ed Piscor's upcoming comics include Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, collecting all of the Hip Hop Family Tree comics, in one volume along with 140 extra pages. You can pre-order that one now as well. Also, Red Room is starting its third season, Crypto Killers. Those first couple of issues are available for pre-order now as well as the first two volumes of Red Room in trade paperback form. You can also still pick up the Hip Hop Family Tree Treasury Sized Editions, X-Men Grand Design Volumes 1 through 3. There's also an X-Men Grand Design Omnibus and WYSIWYG. And now back to our video. Before the Pancakes book, I had been working on a graphic novel for that took me a long time, Artichoke Tales. And it, I, I was working on it off and on for 10 years. And, and really, it was because, you know, I couldn't afford to do comics all the time. I had freelance jobs. I had day jobs. Then I had a kid. You know, all these things taking my time away from Artichoke Tales. And meanwhile, I was, you know, like a lot of cartoonists, I was doing little short stories for anthologies on the side and doing other stuff. And um, and so it was really hard for me to kind of keep the drawing style for Artichoke Tales consistent because it was over so much time and other things were happening and I was getting interested in other stuff. But I had, you know, I had this look that I wanted for Artichoke Tales and and it was like line art and then and then the tone was was done like a, a dot pattern tone in photoshop and i was trying to keep it simple and just sort of like keep everything else out and i guess for the purposes of that book it was a good choice you know it, it still looks very consistent over 200 plus pages but it was driving me crazy artistically you know i just felt kind of like trapped and bored and just like oh get me out of here <laughs> and then i um i got a chance like in the midst of all that i got a chance to do this story for the new york times um the they they were doing this series in the um mid 2000s called the funny pages where they ran a, a page of comics a week and so a, they would choose a cartoonist and you do it for six months so you get to do a fairly long story so um I got the chance to do it, which was really cool. And I did this story called Watergate Sue. And I decided to um, do it like in full color, like digital color, which I'd done a little bit for, you know, very short stories before that, but not a lot. And um, 
I didn't, I didn't quite realize how much work it was going to be uh, using like a full palette of colors. And I quickly got in over my head and I had this weekly deadline with the New York times. Like you do not fuck with the New York times and their deadlines. I mean, they are, it is scary working with them. Like it's just, it's just, you're on this little hamster wheel. So I, um, I actually like on the fly hired Austin English to help me with the coloring, which thank God. Um, but by the time those two projects were done, doing Watergate Zoo and then finishing Artichoke Tales, I was just so tired of working digitally. Like, I just really, I don't know about you, Jim, but I just like, I just missed paper. I just was like, why is, is my whole art life happening on this screen? Like, you know, there's digital color is really cool and there's so much cool stuff you can do, but I just was like, I, I need to get back to my roots, man. You know, and I just thought about like when I first started doing comics and, and black and white was really the only possibility because color was so expensive in the early 90s. Um, I just sort of forgotten, like, how did I even do shading back then? And I looked at my comics and realized I didn't do shading. <laughs> like, I basically never really, it was either black or it was white. And, um, so I just kind of decided I wanted to re-engage and um, I looked at, you know, a lot of artists work who I really love. Like I love the way Tove Janssen, who does the Moomin Trolls, I love her approach to shading um, with black and white. I love how Gabrielle Bell works. Of course, I love Julie Doucet and the Hernandez brothers. And so I just kind of went back to school on that and, um, and so the first couple stories for this pancakes book, which kind of took shape like, okay, I want some other short stories to go along with Watergate Sue. Um, it kind of took shape that way. Uh, the first story I did what finished was the cats in service story, which is just pen and ink. But then I just was like seeing how like there are people doing mini comics these days, like, with risograph, with like colored pencil, with just graphite pencil, with watercolor. Like there's just this freedom of medium that had sprung up because color copying had gotten cheaper, color, everything having to do with color had gotten cheaper. And so you could just do comics with really any, any art medium that you chose. It wasn't as constricted as when we started. And so, that was really the inspiration. I was like, I want to try a colored pencil comic. I want to try a watercolor comic. And, and this idea of, of engaging with paper was kind of the overarching theme. Um, and so I just decided to go for it. But when I, when I got to the watercolor story, so that's, it's called the egg room. And, um, there's a lot of dreaming in that story, daydreams and nighttime dreams. And I, and I thought watercolor would be really great for it. Just that sort of blurry um, mixing reality and dreams together. Just col watercolor seemed to lend itself to that. And I started doing some sample panels and I just realized that I'd always just kind of faked my way through watercoloring. I didn't really know how to do it so I actually took a watercolor class in order to to do that story because it just I just again I just felt like really in over my head and I had I had a pretty clear vision of what I wanted and I didn't know how to get it on my own um so yeah I took a class and it was great I, I just learned so much and you know I, I was such a failed art school student like I said before I only lasted a semester at art school <laughs> So it, I, I'm realizing now as I'm older, like I'm, I'm mature enough to like take an art class and like take what I need from it, but not let it like derail me. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really useful. I think about that all the time. I went to school right after high school. I went to college and I think all the time, like you would have the continuing ed students or like these older students that seemed so focused compared to like <laughs> my friends and me. And it's, like, I always think about that, like, it's kind of a bad system that we just keep going through school, you know, if you don't take any time off, because I don't know that you appreciate it or recognize. I had one instructor that I took one class with, he was a woodworking teacher. 
but he mm-hmm. was one of like the top 15 woodworkers in the country. Like I should have taken every single class I could take from him based on this is the person who's like outstanding at what he does. Just, just learn from him, like pick up habits, you know, follow him around. But I didn't know, you know, I was, yeah. I was 20 and, you know, hindsight being 2020, like if I could yeah. redo some of those choices, but it is great. Like taking classes now and, and, you know, um, we've talked, Ed and I have taken classes, like writing classes and things, uh, even since we started this channel. Um, why not? You know, like a lot of yeah. city, any decent sized city usually offers a lot of resources like that. And now you could even take them online, probably online. most of these disciplines. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's great to hear you say that, because I think there's so many barriers for people making things. And to know, like, you know, as a professional and somebody with your experience to still say, oh, I want to try it this way, but I need to take a class or learn how to do this particular skill. Um, that's that's encouraging. I, I, I like hearing that. That's interesting. And also what a commitment, you know, like um, I've, I've been saying more and more, one of the skills that people really need, I think, to be a good cartoonist is have that vision, you know, to be able to really think like, I want this story to look this way mm-hmm. before you actually see it. Um, that's not the easiest thing to do. Yeah, it it's not. And, and, and um, I, I don't know, I've been looking back a lot lately, like looking at those old issues of Girl Hero, especially the first few. And, and I just look at those comics and I think, wow, they look so 80s. Like they are so of their time. And, and when you're young, uh, you don't, you don't, ha- you don't have a lot of historical context you know, you're, you're picking up on like visually on what's around you, but it doesn't, you know, I didn't think when I was doing Girl Hero, like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this like 80s look. I was just in the 80s, you know, looking at stuff. Right, of course. <laughs> you no, know, I was like looking at Sue Ko and, um, and that cartoonist Carol Moisewich. And I really loved like, like all that cool art that Bill Sienkiewicz was doing back then. And, you know, all of that like sifted down into my kind of like half-assed, you know, can't really draw comics. Um, And, and you, you know, you see it now, you see the young artists coming up now, the stuff they're influenced by, like, I mean, I just see this like risograph influence everywhere in Seattle. I don't know if it's, that's going on in Pittsburgh, but like these kind of fluorescent colors and this sort of off register effects. And, and it's really neat, but it's like, I'm assuming that the kids who are just starting today, they're not really thinking like, Oh, I'm going for this 2020s look. They're just in what they're in. Um, But I'm just really restless artistically. And I just, I can't seem to stick with the same style. Right. Let's talk um, a- another story in that collection, the Golden Lasso you did with Color Pencil. And there's a mm-hmm. note in the back of the book. You have notes on all the stories, um, kind of brief notes. But you mentioned like choosing Color Pencil for that because it's about these rock climbers. And you thought the Color Pencil captured granite, which is a fantastic reason to <laughs> choose that. You know, um, that story is amazing. And the Color Pencils are a big part, I think, of that, of my reaction to that. Um, it yeah. just it looks so good, but also pretty unique. I know that everything can be reproduced now, but there aren't a lot of comics that look good that are done with colored pencil. Oh, well, gosh, I beg to differ. Like I was really influenced um, in, to, in that decision by Rena Ayu Yang, um, mm-hmm. who she did this comic in color, mostly in colored pencil called Blame It on the Boogie. And um, I just loved what she was doing. And she just looked so free. It, the work just like looked so free and happy and loose. And I was like filled with envy. Like I've become such like a tight ass in my work. And that was, you know, that was a big part of like trying out all these different materials. Um, you do some really great layouts in that story too. If you're thinking of like, um, you know, being looser, like there are pages mm-hmm. where like you'll have, they're not grids at all. And then there'll be like maybe a column of a couple of small panels on a side of a panel or side of the page. And, you know, going through that, that was another thing that stood out to me. So it's, it's interesting to hear, you know, you wanting to get out of maybe a rigid or very controlled technique. Um, Yeah, I did. And I, um, I was, I, I really tried, uh, especially in that story to kind of stay true to the, the early drafts. 
Um, I, I had like a real big cutter and paster, like literally like copying my drawings and cutting them out and rearranging the panels and then like realizing, oh, I, ne I actually need some connecting panels here and then like drawing in some extra little ones. And then like I was looking at those and I was thinking, well, that's I, I kind of want to keep that almost collage -y look even though I redrew them in colored pencil I stuck with those kind of nutty layouts because I don't know I just I just felt like it was important to kind of keep it keep it somewhat raw in the in the way that story unfolds um the kind of like bringing back of certain of your memories coming back in patchy ways. I felt like that kind of raw layout kind of lent itself to communicating that. Yeah. There, those layouts were really interesting, but also they weren't um, hard to read or follow or anything. You know, it's not okay. like you were sacrificing any clarity in order to do like, Oh, it's a cool page layout, but good luck guessing which panel you're supposed to read next. You know, it was very clear in that regard. Um, but it just felt like, again, one of the things that attracts me to comics is just how much you can actually do with them. You know, yeah. there, there are so few rules, especially if you're trying to like break rules and, you know, kind of do whatever you want. Page layout's one of those things that I think, again, people don't, a lot of us don't exploit. I do tons of six panel grids. So, you know, maybe yeah. I'm talking to myself when I say that, but it, it was something I always find refreshing whenever somebody does do interesting layouts and layouts that still work, even though they're outside of that grid. So very cool to see that. I don't want to give anything away in that story. Um, you are free to, but there is a there there are some surprises throughout that story. And one of the things, like as I was reading it, I was super into just the rock climbing part. You know, you oh, have these cool. three characters that are climbing together. One of them is really almost obsessed with becoming a great climber. Um, are you a rock climber? Have you climbed rocks in the past? It sounded like it, it sure seemed believable to me. Yeah, well, this this story is is like pretty much a hundred percent autobiographical, which is unusual for me. Like, really, it's the first time I've done that. I I uh, I'm really a fiction person, and often the settings of my stories are are based on my life. Like a lot of my stories take place in the Northwest and in Seattle, um, but the things that happen are always made up and the the elements of my life tend that come in tend to be small details you know like clothing or an apartment that i lived in but not the actual events but that story is is autobiographical and so i i the the character who's completely obsessed with becoming a rock climber is me um and it's uncomfortable to say that because I, I'm not used to being an autobiographical cartoonist, but there it is. Um, and I, yeah, I did, I, I had this obsession with rock climbing as a teenager. And I, and I really think that um, while I don't rock climb anymore, it, 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 it formed my personality in, in the sense of that kind of, very narrowly focused like ambition which then I transferred to comics <laughs> I mean a, a number of years later it didn't go straight to comics but like when I kind of uh started making comics I I felt really quickly like oh I've come home like this is my medium and then I just kind of never looked back and I I hadn't really had that experience of just like this is what I'm going to do since my um, early teen rock climbing obsession. I often think about people that I know that don't have that in their life, whatever that mm -hmm. thing is. Mm -hmm. And it's so bizarre because like, I know people that live their whole life that way. And it's mm -hmm. like, they never found that thing, that calling that, I hate to say obsession, because there's some negative connotation that can go with that. Right. Uh, but I know so many people that they just haven't found that thing. So it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that and that you have found that a couple of times. Because I often think that's what's missing is people that haven't found it, just they didn't try something that spoke to them that way. You know, they never crossed paths with whatever that interest was. And as a result, I don't know, it's a very different way to live than having like something that's like kind of always in my mind, you know, yeah. driving a lot of things that I do. Um, I can't imagine what it'd be like not to have that. Yeah, my mother often said, 
you know, she would contrast me and her and say like, I never, I never had like a one thing. And, you know, being my mom, she observed me a lot and she was like, you kind of always did. And, 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 you know, she couched it as like, um, just a sort of personality difference. Um, and she, you know, she died a few years ago. And so I was spent a lot of time thinking about like what she accomplished in her life. And she tried so many different things. And I kind of envy that, you know, because I haven't tried a lot of different things. I've spent a lot of time sitting at my table drawing comics, you know, but there's a whole wide world out there. <laughs> Yeah, as I get older, I think about that. <laughs> the amount of time accumulated <laughs> in a room with my back to the world, yeah. um, it, it, it can add up. It's it's almost fun whenever you're young and doing it. But as I get older, it's like, it's years that, you know, if you put it all together, it's it's years of sitting in a room with your back to the world. And that's, it's kind of weird. Um, you mentioned a little bit about process and editing. Uh, I'd love to get into that a little bit more. I've been reading and, and working on more short stories. You know, I think comics are well suited to that, um, but it is a struggle. And uh, you seem like a great writer. So I'm curious about your background as a writer and how you approach putting a story together for a comic. Yeah. So, well, I, I, um, I've always liked to write and draw. It's, you know, it's hard to remember a time before that I like to make little stories as a kid and illustrate them and I started keeping a journal when I was in maybe sixth grade I think sixth grade and I I've been more or less keeping a journal ever since um and I was a huge letter writer as a as a kid, mostly in my teens, again, this sort of pre-internet world, we wrote letters to each other, especially like I had a lot of older friends who went off to college before I did, and I missed them desperately. And so we just wrote, you know, long letters to each other. <laughs> and um, so I, yeah, I think that's how I became a writer. Um, was uh, writing in my journal and writing letters to my friends. Um, and it's, it's for the, for a long time, it was how I made comics. Like I would basically write a script and then I would adapt the script into a comic as if sort of as if I was two different people um, because I was much more comfortable as a writer than as a drawer. Um, and I still am in a lot of ways, like drawing is a struggle for me, whereas writing is really not. Um, but as I started doing more comics, I, I, I realized that often my ideas, my initial very embryonic ideas were images. And so it kind of was this extra step that would lose things if I, if I wrote first. And, and so I started to try to draw first, even though there was so much that couldn't be figured out through a drawing. And I really, really owe that sort of shift to Linda Berry. Um, I took a writing class from her, but what I took away from the writing class <laughs> was that, that I, I could kind of tap into my own creativity in a more direct way if I started my comics with drawing and drew as much as I possibly could before starting to write. And I actually think of myself as sort of tying my writing self's hands behind her back and let the drawing self have a little bit of a head start because she's slower and less has less facility, but I feel like she is the one with the really good ideas. So I just try to draw what I can picture in my head and, and just let those drawings be for a while. And then I start writing. And then the wonderful thing about writing is it's like such a great way to organize your thoughts. And, and that, you know, I eventually get to a point where I do outlines. Like a lot of times when I, I have a story that I feel sort of all over the map and not working very well, I try to 
just outline like what is actually there, like a very honest outline, even if it's in, you know, it turns out to be insane when I put it in outline form, then you can really see like, oh, there's problems with the story. <laughs> so then like I, I take my realistic outline and then I make what I think of as an aspirational outline. So then I put in the things that, that is like easier to see that are missing. And then I sort of, then I go back to the comic, you know, comics form and start figuring out how to get in those bits that that outline exercise kind of showed me was missing. Um, so, yeah, so my process, I mean, I'm writing as much as drawing, but, but, it, but it has really become really important to me to draw first um, and then use those like wonderful problem solving tools of writing later like for example the egg room um there's an older woman and a young man and their relationship's a little bit ambiguous and i did a lot of writing to sort of try to figure out what is the deal between those two people because whenever i would draw them i would just like they would get like really romantic and stuff, but I was suspicious of that because I just wasn't convinced that he would be that interested in her. And I just couldn't really get anywhere with drawing them. And so, so I kind of like shifted gears and just spent a lot of time like sort of free writing. Like I was in a creative writing class, just like writing about what the possibilities of their relationship were because I just realized I wasn't figuring anything out with drawing anymore. So yeah, often I shift to writing when I sort of reach a point where drawing isn't getting me any farther in terms of figuring out the actual events of the story. Does that make any sense? It does make sense. Yeah, it, it, it's something that I do a little bit, the back and forth between the drawing and the writing and outlines and script. And, you know, like they come in very much in pieces for me. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it makes sense what you're describing. It's one of the real challenges of making comics, I find though, you know, like once you step outside of say that assembly line, Marvel DC kind of process where like one person writes a script and it goes off to somebody, they might not even talk, you know, it's just like instructions on drawing. Um, those aren't my favorite comics, you know, like there have been some that I've enjoyed, but overall, like most of the comics I like, it's usually the work of one person who, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of their vision, but how you turn that vision into a coherent comic that makes sense to somebody else it takes all the tools you can find. So, you know, going yes, back and forth between everything. the writing and drawing, I think is, is something that's, you don't see it in the how-to books because it's, it's very difficult to work that way. But in reality, I think that a lot of writer artists do work that way. Uh, at least a lot of the ones that I ask these questions to. Yeah. Do you- Yeah, um, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say like, I know that there are plenty of cartoonists who have a very disciplined, process of like thumbnail script thumbnail blah blah yeah I, I'm not just never been able to follow the same process with every story I have these techniques that I do over and over like I do a lot of cutting and pasting I do a lot of outlining <laughs> um but the order you know it's like it's more like I have a toolbox of approaches and the order I do them in changes because each story has its own problems. Yeah, I, I taught comics for a while at SVA and that was like one of the things that, that I would often do early in the class is have students go through and talk about what makes, you know, for a good comic or a good story. And you'd have a list of things, right? You'd have the story, the plot, the characters, the actual visuals, you know, you'd have all these things and my takeaway after a little bit of doing that is it kind of doesn't matter the order that you address these elements. You just need to kind of like consider them before you cross that finish line if you want yeah. to help with a good final piece because they do come in different orders. Even if you do this over and over, often yeah. you end up working maybe your own process a little differently. Um, I was going to ask, have you worked with an editor? Has that been a part of your process? Uh, well, I have a lot of friend readers. Um so I guess, yeah, my editorial experience has been with friends. Uh, I've done most of my books with Fanagraphics and they're 
they're pretty hands off as editors, I think, compared to what I hear the editorial experiences it um, like with more like the mainstream comics publishers. And I think that's like a really important part of their ethos, you know, about giving artists a lot of freedom. Um, although I worked with Eric Reynolds for the first time on the pancakes book and we've known each other for a long time. And so I was able to just say, Hey, I, you know, I could really, I, the book was mostly finished, but I really appreciated his feedback. And I did, I didn't do much redrawing, but I did, I did do some rewriting in response to things that he, that he, feedback that he gave me but my friend readers are like the people who are willing to look at a comic in its early stages which as you know can be just like <laughs> a difficult thing for an outsider to interpret um and so it's the rare and special people who are willing <laughs> to look at my work at that stage where, you know, their feedback could be genuinely helpful because I'm still constructing the story. Um, and one of, one of my friend readers is a novelist, but she loves comics. So she, you know, she, she, she kind of can get what I'm laying down even in really rough form. Um, and, and her feedback is always really helpful because she's kind of, she's a very meticulous plot constructor, which I'm not so much. So I really appreciate that lens. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I can't imagine making comics without, without friend readers. It, it's, it's a, it's a huge part of the process for me because I, I really, really am dying to be understood, you know? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make comics that are just completely obscure and mystifying to people. I want people to, you know, understand on some level. That's interesting. Do you, do you have, do you have like an imaginary, you know, this is your audience or this is your reader that you're, you know, creating for in mind whenever you're working? Not really. Like I was a huge J.D. Salinger fan as a teenager and I, um in one of the books i think it's i think it's either seymour or raise high the roof beam carpenters one of the characters is talking to the to a writer character it's a letter i think and he is just this wonderful sort of outpouring of like support and like go forth young man and do your writing and 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 basically what he says is like what you've got to do is you've got to write the stories that you most want to read in the world and um like that hit me like a ton of bricks as an impressionable teenager and it's been it's been my goal ever since and i mean i'll be honest as a young woman in the 90s um there were not a lot of comics that like affirmed me and who I was and what, what I cared about in the world. I mean, there were plenty of novels and movies. It's not like I had nothing, but as far as comics, there was just not a lot out there that, that like, what, you know, I'd be reading and I'd be like, yes, this <laughs> is what I want. I mean, like Julie Doucet was about it. And so the, you know, I mean, in, in a way it was kind of cool because like the path was fairly open for me to just say, okay, I'm going to put the comics in the world that I want to read. And I didn't worry too much about the audience. I got to say, I never really have. Maybe yeah. that's why, maybe that's why I, uh, you know, have the career position that I have, which is sort of like cartoonists, cartoonist. Uh <laughs> Wow. There's a lot there. I, I love the part about the understanding thing, because that was something that I would see with a lot of young cartoonists, whether they were students or maybe like people I'd meet at SPX or one of these shows, in that it's almost mystifying if you haven't published work to get mm -hmm. reaction. You know, like when we would do critiques in class and, and you would see some of these cartoonists would be shocked that like their idea, what they had, and if they told you what was happening in their story, it was very different than if the readers said what yeah. they were seeing in the story. Oh, and yeah. you could almost see that expression on their faces of like, it, you know, it didn't, 
it, it never occurred to them like how this actually reads if you don't know the ins and outs and the revisions and you know what they had in mind to begin with. Yeah, um, yeah that's 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 an interesting part of making comics, and I don't hear it talked about very much anymore. Oh my god! But it's god. something that I knew early on yeah. when I was making stuff and would make my friends read the comics, and they were terrible. You know, the comics, not my and friends. Your friends didn't really understand. <laughs> right? The story, they they had. Right? It yeah. was such a different reaction than what was in my head. And, Ugh, you know, you, so you have painful. to learn that, but. It's so painful. It's still painful. You know, when I, when I still like, even now, like showing early drafts to people and I could just see on their face that they're not, like, they're trying, they're not really following. They can't handle what I'm laying down. And it's like, Oh, okay. But that's what you have. I mean, it's incredibly painful to not be understood. But you have to like hear some of that back from people in order to, to start getting at like, okay, what do I need to fix? What do I need to add? What do I need to take out? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know some cartoonists don't really have readers and I like in their early drafts, I don't, I don't know how they do that, honestly. Yeah, it's a good, good point. It's, uh, it's almost something that maybe they develop that skill while you know in front of an audience essentially you know maybe they're uh and maybe, and maybe they're intuitively good at it too you maybe know they're like, better at it than we I, I always think there's like almost like an equalizer you could have like the 10 skills of a, of a good <laughs> cartoonist or in a good comic and like we'd all have these different levels and some people you know are we're all naturally good at some of them and have to work harder at others and some people may be just very good at that communication part of actually getting across what they intend um, yeah but that, I mean, it goes back to being a kid whenever you draw the terrible picture when you're five and your, your mom doesn't really know what it is. Oh God. <laughs> I know. I know. I hated that as a kid so much. And my, my husband now, he has this tendency, he loves comics. He has this tendency, he has like an unerring eye for like the thing in a panel that I, that I drew in the most like kind of messed up way. <laughs> but he'll always say, oh, I love this little person over here, <laughs> you know, that I just totally like messed up and it's just completely fucked up looking. And that, that's always his favorite thing in the panel. That's funny. Okay. I, I always make that comment about like, um, I worry about obsession and, and sort of like, the thing where you're erasing and redrawing the same background detail 15 times and can't move on to the next page. And it's often some element that's like, nobody's looking at this. Nobody it's not cares. the main character. You know, it's <laughs> not the important part, but you, you, I'm, depending again on, you know, kind of what your leanings are, like I really had to break myself from that and, and sort of say, you know, that back left corner, just erase the stupid dresser that you can't get the perspective <laughs> right because it's not, it's not that important. Uh, you know, and you end up spending a disproportionate amount of time on something that's just like, time better spent somewhere else. Yeah. Um, wow. I feel like we haven't covered a lot of your career. Um, you've won, <laughs> you know, I mentioned the Zerich Award early on. You mentioned Watergate Sue being in the New York Times Magazine, which is amazing. You've won a couple of Ignatz Awards for Outstanding Cartoonist and Outstanding Mini Comic. Um, that Outstanding Mini Comics uh, is something that I always cherish because, again, I think of Mini Comics as SPX. So yeah. um, you also teach comics. Is that right? Or, or teach writing? Well, I, you know, I've taught in little ways for years, like I'll do a workshop here and there, but I never had like an ongoing gig. Like, it sounds like you had at SVA for a while. Um, so I'm just kind of dipping my toe into that right now. I'm teaching a six week class here in Seattle at Hugo House, which is a nonprofit writing center but they do have comics classes from time to time. And the comics class I'm teaching is called Comics for Writers. So it's it's sort of following this sort of way of working that I've developed because I think of myself as primarily a writer to you know find ways to let those, the drawing come out first. And um, you know for years I would do workshops and people come up to me at the end and they'd say, I've written a, you know, 3000 page graphic novel that takes place in a, you know, post-apocalyptic future. And, and um, you know, I'd love it. it. You know, I just think it's like full of great ideas and like, maybe you could draw it for me. And um, 
I know I'm not the only cartoonist who had that experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm laughing because I think every cartoonist has had that experience. <laughs> like, like people are always like, I've done you this favor by like writing this really long thing. I've gotten the hard part out of the way for you. <laughs> All you have to do is draw it. Um, which just like like this cumulative experience made me realize that often people who are who are primarily writers, they just their writer self like outpaces their drawing self and then they get to this point where they just know they they never could could draw such a thing and so a big part of my teaching is like if you you got to let that drawing drawing person come out at the beginning um and do it do it commensurately so that you don't wind up with the 3000 page script you know that you can't draw it's 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 amazing to think of you developing this approach <laughs> based on people coming up with that with that here's the perfect script for you um because again that that's happened to everybody i know that draws comics everybody. and it happens a lot it's more than once yeah um that's funny um i'm also curious about like the short story versus the graphic novel you know you mentioned uh artichoke tales being this graphic novel that took 10 years to to create most of your work is much shorter um I wondered if, you know, like coming into this interview, if that was something that you preferred the short story format or, you know, maybe that is just practical based on your experience making a graphic novel. Well, yeah, I am. Um, I like to think of myself uh, like um, I model myself after Alice Munro, uh, who is a writer who I really admire. And she wrote one novel and everything else she wrote in her entire career was short stories. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Alice, I did my one, <laughs> one graphic novel. It's short stories from here on out. And um, I, well, like I said before, I'm kind of restless and artistically. And I, the, like the whole time I was working on Artichoke Tales, I always was like cheating on it by doing short stories. And uh, yeah, I just, I just don't think that I'm constitutionally cut out for graphic novels, which is unfortunate because that seemed to be like what the market prefers is graphic novels over collections of short stories, but whatever, it's just not me. And when I was working on pancakes, I, I was working, I was always working on like three stories at a time, which was perfect because if I would start to feel like, Ugh, I this isn't working, I, I would have something else to work on. And so I had, I, I finally like started getting my tendency to cheat, uh, like working for me, you know, because like I always had another legit story to turn to if one was not going well for me. Do you think of the stories and who will make the pancakes as almost novellas? They, they feel a little bit longer than a lot of the short stories that I encounter in comics. They are very long. They are very long indeed. Like uh, Watergate Sioux, which is the story that I finished first uh, and what the whole book was built around is actually the shortest story in the book. And um, I don't I don't quite know how that happened. Um, I think I I think. Yeah, I think maybe I'm a novella cartoonist <laughs> because I, yeah, I really liked that like 30 to 40 page story length. Um, yeah. I so found I, them very rewarding to read at that length. You know, there's a okay. lot of character. There's a lot of room. Um, they don't feel overly dense, which is something that sometimes turns me off from some comics reading. Um, but they also, like I said, they felt more substantial than, you know, I think of short stories and comics, a lot of like six or eight or 10 page stories. And mm -hmm. I've read many good ones at that length, but mm -hmm. this felt like a different reading experience, like a little bit more developed characters, more developed worlds, more complex nuance. Um, just a very interesting reading experience. And by interesting, I mean unique. You know, there's not a lot of work that fits that size, maybe for the reasons you mentioned. You know, if you were going to publish those on their own, 40 pages is really an awkward fit for, awkward. you know, from a market standpoint, uh, which mm -hmm. is, I don't know if other creators in other fields think this way, <laughs> like they have to be conscious of like the market, <laughs> you know, while they're making work. But it sure seems like that's a big part of comics making. <sighs> yeah, well... It's a, you know, it started as a commercial art. It's always been. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe unavoidable. 
Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of an hour here, Megan. Um, one of the things that I should have asked early on is about your book tour. Mm, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So my book came out in November and I, um, I went to a bunch of comic stores and bookstores here in the Seattle area and Portland and California. Um, and then I went to SPX, good old SPX, which I hadn't been to in over 15 years and saw just a lot of people who, who I hadn't seen in many years, comics people. And I just started to realize that like there were all these people from the Midwest who I only ever saw on the East Coast or in California at comics events that I'd known for decades. Um, you know, like people like Zach Sally, for instance, or um, or Sasha Mardu, who lives in St. Louis. And I just was like, I want to go to the Midwest. I want to see... I want to see all those comic book stores like Quimby's and Chicago. And I, I want to see John Porcelino and I just want to like go on their turf. And I, and so I said, Hey, Fanagraphics, uh, can I go on a tour of the Midwest? And they're like, you'll sell five books. <laughs> and then that was kind of like the end of the discussion. And so I just decided I, I'm just gonna like do it myself because I'm 55 years old and it ten, it seems to take me 10 years to do a book. So I was like, am I gonna wanna go on a DIY tour of the Midwest when I'm 65? Will that be more fun than doing it now? Probably not. So I'm just kind of in the phase of my life of like, if not now, when? So I'm doing it. Um, so I'm starting out in Pittsburgh and I hope you'll come, Jim. It's, uh, it's at Copacetic, Copacetic Comics on Saturday, May 27th is the kickoff to my East Midwest tour. <laughs> Excellent. And then I'm going to Columbus. I'm going to a store called $2 Radio. I don't know that store. Then I'm going to St. Louis. I'm going to a store called Left Bank Books. Then I'm going to Cake in Chicago, which I'm very excited about. I've been hearing about Cake for years, and now I get to go. And then I'm going to Milwaukee. I'm going to a store called Lion's Tooth. And then I'm ending up um, in Minneapolis and I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm looking at my notes because the Minneapolis thing has just emerged. So it's this like literary series called rain taxi, but they, they do events in, in different places. They don't have a set place. So they just found me a slot at a bookstore called next chapter. So Minneapolis will be my last stop. So six stops. East Midwest. And I'm going to be promoting like all the specifics on my Instagram and Facebook dates and times and all that. Um, but yeah, I'm really, where, where should people, what is your uh, Instagram? Where should people follow you there? What is my Instagram? I think it's girl hero, but I think it, you know how Instagram you can search on a name and it also will pop up on my name. So, but yeah, I think my girl, girl hero is my Instagram handle. And I'm also on Facebook and not really on Twitter. That's me. Excellent. Um, well, I wish you the best on the tour. I think that should be really fun. It uh, kind of makes me a little jealous because <laughs> I love visiting <laughs> comic book stores. And um, all those cities are, uh, they're, they're good literary towns and good comics towns. So I would expect to uh, sell more than five books. I would pack more than yeah, five Yeah, I'm going to prove Fanagraphics wrong, man. That's right. That's that's the challenge to the cartoonist kayfabe audience out there. Um, <laughs> if you're in these cities, if you're close to these cities, uh, look for Megan whenever she's coming through and uh, support those books. Um, anything else, Megan, before we wrap up? Have I forgotten anything? I don't know. I've had a really <laughs> fun time talking comics with you, Jim. It's yeah, this this is uh, this is this has been great. Like I said, I, I found your work very early on, and I remember one of the things specifically was an interview with Brian Ralph, 
um, that was on your website. And it website. Had all kinds of information uh, that was useful to me back then. So it's it's pretty awesome to have a chance to sit down and actually compare notes with you today. So thanks for your time, Megan. Good luck on the tour. Good luck with the new book. And um, hopefully a lot of us will see you in Pittsburgh here at the end of May. Yay. Thank you.